this guy named Alexander Wong. He is the 25 year old CEO of a company called Scale AI. So he is, you know, the CEO of Scale AI. But I think one thing that's um, that's not mentioned a lot is that one of his main clients is like the U.S. Army. Cool. Yeah, it's just what representation that like we can be the villains too. I don't know. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Welcome to the Politically Asian Podcast. We're just two Asian American buds talking about politics and the Asian American community in hopes of getting more Asians to talk about politics. We are coming at you live from Brooklyn, New York. My name is Jerry Lim. My pronouns are they, them. And you can find me across the internet at Jerryaki. That's G-E-R-R-I-E-Y-A-K-I. And my co-host... Hey, my name is Aaron Yin. My pronouns are he, him, and you can find me on social media at Aaron Flarin. That's A-A-R-O-N-F-L-A-R-I-N. Okay, great. So we're going to go into our uh, new segment this season called Practice What You Preach. Um, on the pod, we talk about politics often, but it's also important to actually do those things. Um, so each week we share one thing we did related to politics and or organizing. Um, do you want me to go first or do you want to go first? Uh, you should go first. Okay, great. What did I do this week? I RSVP'd to to do um to go to a DSA meeting. Oh really? <laughs> yeah, I guess just because like I was I I was like interested, and then I realized it was last night. So we're not doing too well in actually following through, but <laughs> we did we did actually get around to RSVPing, and I did get the Zoom link, and then I was like, oh shit, I was supposed to go to that. Um, so there is that, but um, I will counterbalance my absence from actually attending with the fact that I am now on terms with my coworkers about talking about our salaries. So, you know, a little bit of salary transparency there. And uh, yeah. Oh, okay. No, that's cool. No, it's, <laughs> I like how this segment puts a little pressure on both of us to do <laughs> something, you know, so yeah. <laughs> like worst case, even if we did nothing, you know, I guess there would be some kind of like, a little bit of like shame or something to try to do something next <laughs> week but no um that's it sounds like you did two things right you tried going to a dsa meeting and then salary transparency at work seems very hot right very cool um what what made you decide to want to join dsa i have many thoughts but i will withhold all of them and just watch you go along the ride <sighs> I mean, I feel like knowing you, our thoughts are probably the same. Um, so the thing about DSA is that you don't get access until like you like sign up, register, pay dues, I think. Um, so I I paid dues, I think like a couple months ago. And then like, oh my. I know. I, what are the dues? Uh, it's, it's actually like pay what you can. Um, but oh, I was okay. like, I, I feel like I should pay like the regular amount because <laughs> it's not like, you know, like I feel like I should. Um, so I, I was like, Oh shit, I'm paying. For, I'm like technically paying for this. I should like log on to like the Slack group. And then there's like actually a Slack group for our, our neighborhood, um, me and Aaron's neighborhood. And, um, uh, it's, it's very white in there. Um, <laughs> so that was like mm. very concerning. I mean, like, kind of a red flag honestly yeah. uh, um maybe the like group at large is like more diverse but uh yeah it's it's pretty white in my group which is surprising because it's central bk which i think includes bed um so there's that <laughs> mm, okay so not too hot on the racial diversity uh what about gender um, I mean, like, if we're going by like pronouns and bio, then like it's not mm -hmm. it's not the worst. It's not too bad. Mm, okay. Um, but yeah, so there's that. Yeah. White gaze, but that feels familiar. <laughs> yeah. Cool. Oh, and wait, when you said regular price, what are we talking? Like Twenty bucks? Oh, Thirty so, bucks? No, no. So for the year, I just went ahead and paid like dues for the year. It was like fifty bucks, I think. Which I was oh, like, okay, that's interesting. Wow. Okay. That's that's one huh. magazine subscription. Whatever. Huh. Interesting. Okay, cool. Yeah. Interesting in and seeing yeah. how that goes. Um, more hot. How's the salary talk go? What and what made you start um, it? Well, 
I mean, like, I think I've told you before, like, I, I really wanted to resist being friends with my coworkers this time. <laughs> Being friends with my coworkers this this time um, since I got laid off at my last company because I'm pretty sure it was a quote unquote cultural thing in that like I got too comfy with my friends slash mm. coworkers and like let a little loose um, in the sense that I was like <laughs> we're, we're acting. <laughs> I mean, like it, we, I was like we're, I was saying things like we're acting like a broke bitch. Like why do we acquire this company? Blah 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 blah. Uh, uh, why mm-hmm. are we getting an NFT? You know, all that stuff. Um, <laughs> Just, you know, letting them know how I really felt. Um, but uh, this design, this this team is like, this team's pretty good. I feel like they're pretty nice as people. Um, and I'm trying not to get like political. I think that's like, sorry, I don't want to say like I'm not getting political because like I feel like timeout salary is like fairly political. I'm just not oh, yeah. like not talking about like formal politics if that makes sense so like when roe v wade happened i'm like ah yeah Mm. that's very bad end of conversation you know like obviously like i know how i feel about it and so like i'm not i'm not trying to um start discourse or engage in discourse yeah yeah (laughs) i don't get paid enough to do that (laughs) yeah you're only talking about like workplace politics and within workplace Mm -hmm. politics it's like pretty much just salary right yeah yeah, yeah yeah so um i i get the vibe that my manager would actually probably even encourage us unionizing mm, um okay but like as a manager he would probably have to say something um but like as a human being he would be he would probably support us unionizing um mm. that said that's very very far off in the yeah. in never possible never future but anyways yeah so We've just been talking a lot about um, salary transparency and stuff like that because uh, half of the team has been like hired recently and half of the team has been here for like two years, um, mm. which I feel like at any company, that's kind of like a big disparity if like half your team is like three months in and the other half is like two years in, um, no in-betweens. Um, and so we were just like, hey, what do raises and stuff look like around here? Because inflation is getting crazy. Mm, yep, yep. Um, <laughs> And one of the people who was like here for a long time, she was like, yeah, like here's, this is what I make. I haven't really gotten a raise since joining. And I was like, mm, yikes. What about you? What'd you do this week? Um, this week I've been doing a lot of planning and flyering for this event this Sunday. It's flyering on Wednesday and postering on Thursday for this mm-hmm. protest in front of Kam Hing Bakery. Um, Kang Hae Bakery, very famous on TikTok for its sponge cakes. Um, but the reason uh, many people in Chinatown are protesting this bakery this Sunday is because the boss of the bakery used to work at a dim sum hall that stole like almost a million dollars from its workers and hasn't paid back a single cent because he transferred yeah. all of the assets from that old dim sum hall to his other businesses. Basically wage theft. So, yeah, pretty exciting. But isn't that also called something else? Like, isn't that called money laundering or something like that? I think money laundering is like when you set up a fake business to to get money for another business. This is only based on me watching Ozark, okay, where they set up a, laund- okay. a laundromat <laughs> as a cover for, like, you know, trafficking cocaine. So I think it, I nice. think it's I think it's a little different. Um it is kind of I mean the only aspect of that's kind of the same as they're moving money to a different place, but um I, mm. I'd say probably not okay. money laundering in this case. Yeah. Okay. What is postering? Postering is taking posters and uh just putting them on, you know, lamp posts and just like and street lamps all yeah, all around the neighborhood. So it was like a group of 10 people. We split up into groups of three and four. We mapped out all the routes. So we put them like all over Chinatown, like a lot of streets, even the famous ones like Pell Street that has um, Pell Street and that little Branch Street in Chinatown that has that very colorful sidewalk art. Oh, road Doyers. Off. Yeah, Doyers. Um, literally like Mott Street, Bower, like every single main Chinatown street. So yeah, we cover a lot of ground um, that day. And and uh, flyering is like when you just pass out flyers, yeah. flyering right? Flyering is me standing on a sidewalk corner being like, hey, read about this protest on Sunday. Come to this protest on Sunday. Uh, you ever been to Kam Hing Bakery? Read about why we're protesting Kam Hing this Sunday. 
whatever whatever catches the eyes okay it's like hey you like you know nice shorts man you, i don't you know it's truly what it's it's a lot <laughs> no like, i know yeah. how y'all work i i know how y'all work <laughs> yeah it's it's a lot like barking for stand-up but just for mm -hmm. protests and i guess like my next question is like why it ha why don't y'all do that in front of come hang like to get like cus like customers that are coming in and out like oh do you ever like fly around there or yeah. hang up posters or anything? Yeah, no, that's a good question. Um, so th um, the reason we don't is mainly because the customers that like Kam Hing, like Kam Hing attracts a lot of tourists, you know, people who come to Chinatown right. for some good food. Um, we're trying to target mainly, you know, residents of Chinatown, uh, people who mm. live in the neighborhood and know about the issues. So it's more or less like going to where they live because um, we don't expect tourists to you know, <laughs> be be consistent supporters here but that that was the reason um reasoning behind that i f i mean you never know i feel like a tourist looking for a good like real new york experience could <laughs> protest yeah i mean they'll <laughs> they'll get the experience on sunday yeah i mean whatever tourists go to buy those sponge cakes on sunday uh i guess that's it's two days before this episode is going to come out but um uh you'll see you'll see photos right okay okay damn i was gonna be like oh tell tell our listeners where they can join in um, well, I don't, I'm going to see if I can make it out this time. Yeah, come this um, <laughs> 1 p.m. Yeah, just show up at 1 yeah. p.m. at Kam Hing Bakery. You'll see, yeah, you'll see us. Yeah. Uh, yeah. Okay, great. Yeah. Cool, cool. Yeah. So, so, uh, this week it's, it's just us again chatting about the news. Um, where do, where do we want to get started? Yeah, let's start. Um, I'll go first with the piece. So today the first Thing I wanted to cover was something I saw in Next Shark first, but I thought it was a good topic to talk about. Okay. This guy named Alexander Wong, um, he is the world's uh, youngest, quote, uh, self-made billionaire. He is the 25-year-old CEO of a company called Scale AI. And what that company does in short is they build AI tools for um, other developers and companies. Okay, before I dive into this, Jerry, immediate thoughts. Uh, <laughs> so, unfortunately, um, I, I, when Aaron put this in the, the outline for today, I was like, why does scale AI sound familiar? And it's because I've met one of the co-founders before <laughs> in real life. Um, it was like a couple years ago, uh, pre-COVID, and I'm trying to figure out like i want to say nice things so or like nothing that's gonna like get me in trouble um i will say the mean things uh, okay <laughs> that's, why, yeah. that's why just to make this clear to the pod we, we this is not a billionaire this is an anti-billionaire podcast we're not okay? pro-billionaire so, yeah it's it's just weird it's just weird when you like yeah j you know fuck jeff bezos like he's this bald white man but like it's like weird when it's like a billionaire who is like um so to be clear, I have not met Alexander Wang. Um, Alexander without the E at the end, by the way, not the designer, but a different Alexander Wang. Um, I've met this. Um, I've met his co-founder Lucy, and um, she's a lot. And all I'm gonna say is I don't think we would have been friends, and that's okay. Um, it's weird to like meet billionaires that like you look like that are Asian and your age. That's that's what I will say. Mm. Um, it's it's like it's like one thing when they're like you know crunchy and old and like ugly uh -huh. and you know but like when they're young and like Asian is just is mm. weird it, it hits a little different that's that's all mm. I'm gonna okay. say okay yeah no I think that's a good litmus test for uh, for Asian people in politics right it's like how do you deal with someone who's also Asian who's not doing good shit um, okay yeah I was just curious before I dive in um, the whole reason I brought this up was. Um, because I think this is like an example of, you know, representation that people want to hype up, but there's a lot underneath that mm -hmm. makes it not that celebratory. Um, I was inspired partially because someone in our Discord, actually, Bryce LV, you know, was thinking of a podcast episode where we talk about why Asian Americans love representation and why it, quote, matters, but in reality, it shouldn't. And this Alexander Wang example is mm -hmm. a good one because this guy... So he is, you know, the CEO of Scale AI, but I think one thing that's that's not mentioned a lot is that one of his main clients is like the US Army, uh, the Air Force and cool. the Department of Defense. Um, their artificial intelligence center who gave them like him like a two hundred and fifty million dollar contract. 
Uh, and so, you know, when I think AI and military, my head immediately goes to drones, robots that may yeah. kill people, and definitely many other, any thing. kind of technology that might be killing other people. So I'm like, great, you are right. a, quote, you know, billionaire, but you also have been making your wealth through the, you know, probable death of, like, other people. Mm, yeah, that's... That's fair. Like when I think of that's interesting because when I think of tech and the military, I think of Plantier and how their facial. I think it was facial recognition technology. Um, they use that. They like sold it to ICE yeah. to Yo, help that's them so like up. <laughs> find. <laughs> yeah, to like help them deport people and and like the uh, the I think one of the founders or something like that or like one of the uh, investors in it. Uh, is like a big supporter of Trump, oh, like you yeah, know, Peter like that Thiel, kind right? of thing. Yeah yeah, 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 yeah. And he is, he was. I know that, like that co-founder that I mentioned, she was a Teal Fellow. So you know, just a lot of, yeah, just a lot of, mm, just a lot of uh, interesting politics with uh, lots of money. Yeah. <laughs> Yeah, uh, he is a self-made billionaire who also got 100k from Peter Thiel to start off the company. <laughs> yeah, I also find that funny. Yeah, it's just what representation that like we can be the villains too. I don't know. <laughs> yeah, no, exactly. I was gonna say that. Yeah, it is representation, but it's for Asian villains, right? This is Asian yeah. villain representation, right? <laughs> yeah. Uh, yeah, that's what we need it's more. Okay, of. I guess. Yeah. Well, continuing down the uh, the topic of tech um there's also the uh amazon's acquisition of one medical oh, which i yeah. yeah so for those of you who don't know because i'm pretty sure one medical is like only in cities like major cities oh, um okay. it one medical is a concierge medicine um tech company and uh basically it's um you can text a doctor or like a clinician um Pretty much any hour of the day, you can send them a picture of like whatever's going on um, and they will answer within the day or like you can video chat them. Um, you can like schedule a video call appointment um, or you can go to like a brick and mortar um, clinic, which is pretty cool. Um, and a lot of like tech companies um, offer one medical membership um, You or you can just pay like out of pocket, which is like $200 a year um, and then like. I think you get like $30 copays um, per like, yeah. But their whole thing is like, we guarantee that you only sit in the waiting room for 15 minutes. Oh, really? um, <laughs> Me? Yeah. I'm going to pull out my little so. watch in time for like 1501. <laughs> yeah, right. Exactly. Um, and uh, the founder, the founder is Asian. The founder mm, is Asian. Okay. So that's uh, the tie. Lee. Okay, people. Listen, the tie yeah, is the yeah, CEO's yeah. Asian. Okay. <laughs> okay. Yeah. Yeah. And it, it's just like, so um, I was just like super interested in this because um uh Amazon had a previous venture into healthcare and they they recruited like Atul Gawande to lead uh, um this thing called Haven Healthcare and they were like we're going to revolutionize the healthcare system cuz and the thinking was like well Amazon can do anything and this was like you know a couple years ago so like Amazon is even more powerful now um and then they gave up on that and they were just like fuck it we'll just we're just going to buy someone so they bought one medical for 3.9 billion um and this is like their first like major foray into like providing healthcare cuz before uh they just they just like deliver pills mm. um so yeah very scary to think about <laughs> yeah i mean i don't know about you but i'm excited about my bezos band-aids you know <laughs> <laughs> yeah yeah very uh interesting oh, times and could you remind like so atul gawande i see in the notes he wrote south asian <laughs> in parentheses but uh, who's <laughs> that, that's all i see <laughs> who's <laughs> haven healthcare atul Sorry, gawande, yeah, south yeah. Asian. so so i've <laughs> <laughs> yeah, so Atul Gawande is um I I've talked about him before on the pod like he's he's a um he's like a chief of medicine I think at like Harvard or, or Mass Gen and then he also teaches at like um both Harvard Medical and Harvard School of Public Health. Um he has a ton of a ton. He has like four. He has four books out. Um they're actually really good um about just like um I, it sounds stupid, but like humanizing healthcare, which like um, this, for example, there's like this one book called The Checklist Manifesto, which like, yes, manifesto is such a bad word to use. But like, basically, it's just like how checklists could like really reduce um, 
morbidity, mortality, uh, and um, that sounds that sounds like setting. some yeah, super self help productivity <laughs> guru shit right there. <laughs> the power of checklists. Ooh, the, it's it's <laughs> it's it's more about it, uh, self help as a mm, doctor or self help in the yeah, medical field. Mm, yeah, something okay, like that. Yeah, I definitely feel a lot of yeah. very you know Jerry public health background coming into all this. You know, very lot of knowledge. I'm yeah, like, I've never yeah, heard yeah. of. I'm, yeah, it's yeah. it's fear. <laughs> yeah, it, it's it's fear. Um, would you would you go to a um, a clinic that was owned by Amazon, like specifically Amazon, not one medical oh, branded? An Amazon one? Um, no, <laughs> straight up no. That that's <laughs> I don't because the thing about Amazon is that they have so much consumer data on us already. So if I go there for like mm. a health purpose, I can imagine they're going to start selling me, you know, more medicines, you know, or, you know, just they're just going to use my data to try to sell me more stuff. Um, and mm -hmm. yeah, I do not like that mixing of, you know, personal medical info with a consumer brand trying to sell you stuff because they will 100% try to just uh, milk more money from you. And then also just very general concerns yeah. that like not a big fan of Jeff Bezos, you know, Amazon's really well known for exploiting <laughs> workers. So um, you know, mm -hmm. not too interested in seeing Amazon grow bigger than it already is. Yeah. What about you? Yeah. I, I, I don't know. Like, what am I supposed to do with my one medical subscription? Cause like, oh, I actually have really one like medical. one medical. Oh, see, I didn't know that at all. Yeah. Oh, okay. I have, I've been, yeah, I've been going to, I use one medical. I really only use it for emergencies, like urgent care stuff. Um, I, I, I see, um, I go to Mount Sinai for all my like primary care needs. Um, but yeah, when, you know, like it's, it's pretty good when you need immediate gratification, <laughs> um, from a medical concern. I see. So it's like, so it's not health insurance. It's just like a separate service on top of health insurance. Yeah. So, yeah. So imagine like a city MD, but like for rich uh, people. Okay. <laughs> Jerry, 1% confirmed. No. <laughs> Yeah, no, no. I, I get it through work. Uh, if if oh, okay. like I ever yeah. leave my company, I'm not. <laughs> I don't get one medical anymore. I don't know what happens on my health info, but and yeah. I mean, what is a uh, what's a uh, what's Tom Lee saying about all of this? You know, <laughs> like that seems to be the biggest. He, he he's already he's already on another startup. Like he he oh, he's like shit. <laughs> yeah he's he's he like left already. There it's like a white oh. dude in charge. I was like, that's why I got sold. No, I'm just kidding. <laughs> Hey, thanks for listening to the episode so far. Um, if you like it, uh, maybe pause right here and give us five stars on either Apple or Spotify. It really helps the pot out um, and it's free. Um, but if you have some money to toss our way, consider subscribing to our Patreon. Uh, we're currently fundraising to get uh, transcripts for our podcast episodes to make them more accessible, hire a video editor, and hopefully get Canva Premium to deliver better memes. Um, so yeah, thanks for listening, and uh, now back to the episode. I I need to. I don't want to make any like opinions or anything. I need to look into like his new venture because I did. I was like trying to do research for this episode, and I don't know. But like uh, something I read was like his new startup wants to position itself against Medicare or Medicaid, and I'm just like. I don't know how I feel about that. Yeah, this sounds um, like bad news bears. Yeah, um, typically startup, the the uh, customer population of like a startup does not typically overlap with like Medicare and Medicaid. <laughs> yeah, yeah, no, for sure, for sure, yeah. Yeah, yeah. yeah. Um, my one note, my last note is that like I do want to see what would happen to prescription medications. Like, will will they be cheaper through Amazon? Oh, like, yeah, you know. I don't know. Scary. Yeah. Um, and then, you know, kind of jumping from health topic to health topic. Uh, the first case of polio in a decade. Uh, and I think it's more than a decade. I, I swear I saw the number 1979 um, was detected in New York State, which is very concerning because if you were born after the year 2000, there's a good chance you did not get the polio vaccine. <laughs> oh, OK. Wait, is polio the one where you have the mark on your arm after you get it? Or is that smallpox? That is smallpox. Uh, okay, never mind. <laughs> yeah, because uh, it's like literally they gave you like a little pox and then the, 
it bursts and that's oh, that's what leaves a scar. Okay. Yeah. Nice. Okay. Well, I guess I'm not sure if I have the polio vaccine. Are you vaccinated for polio? I am. I oh, okay. have all four doses. Um the one thing that was revolution revolutionary about the polio vaccine was that it was an oral vaccine. So like all they had to do was like give you a little drop and that's it. Oh, wow. Okay. That's mm-hmm. that's like what Theranos was trying to be with blood drops, but <laughs> not yeah. successful. Just one drop of this. Yeah. Well, wow. Drop, okay. Yeah. Um, yeah, that is extremely scary. You know, it reminds me of Ronnie Chang's joke about how we're just bringing back these like small organic diseases, like very hipstery almost. That we're just we're just bringing <laughs> these back after like thirty years. I'm like, yo, what the fuck? I I was telling you earlier that I thought polio was something we just got rid of and didn't have to look back, but now it's like it's it's like the ice melted you know from global warming and we found a new strain right. in the ground or something i'm like what the fuck is happening <laughs> yeah no that's i uh, that's that's how i feel too um i don't know i'm i'm i would love to not have more diseases um i think polio was I want to say it was eradicated in the United States. I'm not 100% sure, obviously. Well, definitely um, not now. I mean, <laughs> it's just... Yeah, well, well, it was weird how it happened. It was like an, a vaccinated person um, transmitted it. So he, I, I think like this person didn't have any symptoms and then gave it to an uh, unvaccinated person in like Rockland County or whatever county mm. in New York State. Yeah. Oh, okay. Okay. So, That's kind of strange. I don't even know if you can get a polio vaccine these days mm, yeah you know i love i love fighting three battles at once we got covid ba5 monkey pox and monkey polio pox. now yeah <laughs> <We're just laughs> fighting three battles at once now oh my god infinity wars is it <laughs> yeah. oh my god okay not to be alarmist it, yes it is pretty contagious yeah 70 percent of the cases are asymptomatic and um oh, okay. of its of its symptoms um, the really scary one, which, which president had polio? I can't fucking remember. Like, yeah, I don't, Isabel? I don't remember. Um, the one in the wheelchair. I don't remember. Um, anyways, uh, the, the permanent paralysis is one of the less common, mm. um, symptoms. So, you know, you're probably more likely to get COVID and die from that than you yeah, are to get yeah. polio and okay, paralyzed. Yeah. we well, definitely, <laughs> okay. I mean, it's only one case, right? And it's not spreading. So I'm like, I'm not going to be alarmist about it until it hits New York City. And there are maybe like 50 cases, you know, that I'm like, okay, yeah. that, that's a little concerning. But one, I'm like, <laughs> one person and they already found it. Like, okay. Yeah. You know, praying for, you know, the New York State government to just uh, not subject their shit people. together. Yeah, exactly. Please just, <laughs> I just, I only, my... My my cap is two two bad disease battles per lifetime. Okay, at the same time, <laughs> you know yeah. that's 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 it. No more diseases. Yeah. This is it. Yeah. <laughs> okay. Um. Well, that's that's all the news we wanted to cover this week. I think. Um. After that, uh, Aaron and I wanted to try something new where we like kind of discuss things that we've seen on our various social media feeds. Um. And so the the first thing that I wanted to discuss was this TikTok from the Washington Post, which if you don't follow the Washington Post on TikTok, they're incredible. Um, they did a piece about Thor and uh, body shaming because there was like um, in one of the Avengers movies, which I don't watch, he um, he wore, he like wore a fat suit. Um, oh yeah, yeah, that was and, Thor. Um, yeah. yeah, Infinity Infinity Wars Part Two. It was like a whole thing. Um, because I think like in in later movies he like loses the fat again, or it was like made as a, a punchline. It was yeah. very clearly like meant to be like, aha, this super muscular man is now fat, haha. Um, and this po- this TikTok by the Washington Post basically like uh, dove into like how the idea of like an a quote ideal body image, so like cis women having like um, hips and like big boobs and like being skinny. Or like um, the alpha male with like like buff muscles, like you know all that. Um, it came about roughly around after slavery ended, and white people needed another way to shit on black people and people of color. Because like as as like uh, populations became like more mixed race and like um, uh, what's that word? Uh, heterogeneous, that kind of word. Mm-hmm. Um, 
they were just like, well, we need a way to like control the masses and, you know, like assert our dominance. So we're going to like say that, like, you know, this is the ideal form. Um, and then <laughs> the ideal those form. forms just <laughs> also ideal. happen to be white. Yeah. Um, so yeah, TLDR fat phobia is rooted in a history of racism. Discuss. Mm, okay. Yeah. The, okay. So I think this is important for two reasons. Number one, I always love finding a slight Asian, I guess in this case it's not Asian, but Taika Waititi, you know, uh, Pacific Islander, um, or it's like has Pacific Islander roots. Uh, it's the PI of AAPI if we go that route. <laughs> but um, Hell yeah. yeah de- you know, not a white person is what I'm saying, but I also think it's good to bring up because, you know, very, you know, common theme, at least among Asian Americans is like, oh, my, my mom's calling me fat. My family thinks I'm too fat. Mm-hmm. Uh, a, lot of, a lot of, you know, body image and shaming people for how they look uh still going on um yeah i just never knew it so I, i'm I, i'm like uh i guess after this episode i'll be kind of reading more into it um i guess that immediately makes me think so so then are all like you know like i think about k-pop for example right and like k-pop all the mm-hmm. guys in k-pop are super like skinny kind of buff like are they just also you know were they also just fed the fed the u.s body type image i hmm that's a good question i i don't know like i I, i'm kind of curious where like the notion that notion came from i mean like i'm i wonder if like it also has ties to like um you know like how a lot of like east asians like love to be like pale (laughs) like i wonder if it has like any um uh correlation with like that around the same time um mm. i don't i don't know yeah i um paleness was definitely like a class thing for like in asia like the oh yeah, that's yeah, true like yeah farmers working outside and were very tan if you were richer you could stay indoors and didn't have to work so you were pale um but i heard i heard that's um i remember hearing thing reading hearing i don't know that like um something similar with like uh body image where oh, like really it was good to be seen as fat because it meant that you ate well, like you ate like a king. Oh, like that yeah, kind of yeah. thing. I remember reading that in yeah. my European history textbook, <laughs> but that was that was, during like times of fam, <laughs> like like during times of famine. I thought it was good oh. to be like that, but because that makes sense. Like that means you had literal resources in your body, but I guess during times of, <laughs> I, I guess we're kind of in terms of wealth. I guess it's the opposite. Um. It is interesting. Like, I think I need to do more research because I-, I can see how I can see how white people will try to use another standard after their existing standards are gone. But I'm like, what What does that say about all the other you know examples in different countries? And you know, were they all just affected by the same idea? Or I I, I can only imagine. Like, I can only imagine. Right? Like, I I imagine like because like even then like you know throughout history it it wasn't until like i feel like fairly recently that like you would see like um buff like people of color you know what i mean like for example like media like uh, hollywood media that like went out to the philippines like i imagine it's like mostly like buff white people so i don't know which one came first or like mm. i don't know you know what i mean like i don't know like if it was colonial or like it was like a media thing or what yeah in my head i'm just like okay well well, you know, people normally, you know, drew Buddha and Buddha was like very fat. And, you know, I, I just all these different, all these examples of like. <laughs> Buddha's actually radical. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> okay. I mean, I must admit that like, I do want to see the new Thor movie, but I want to be clear that it's only because Natalie Portman oh, is yeah. in it. Okay. <laughs> yeah, yeah, like, yeah. That's it. <laughs> yeah. I'm glad she's back. Yeah. Okay. <laughs> oh, do we want to talk about like how that like could play a role in like Asian masculinity? Because like, there is that discourse of like asian men not seen as like um what's it called like masculine enough and then like how that kind of plays in or do we want to skip that um how does that make you feel aaron as a yeah. man <laughs> i mean you know i could talk i was like oh that's a big topic we man. are running at 40 i can talk about it briefly like i don't okay i don't know because like there are a lot of asian guys getting getting buff now um you know i think it's like a meme on tiktok it's like when you go to the gym you'll see you always see one really buff asian dude um so like i can see how you know notions of like fat phobia and you know ideal guy image based on like whether it's marvel movies action movies magazines 
can encourage any guy to want to be super buff. But I also, I mean, I too, I mean, I don't want to get like buff buff, but I would just like to work out because I feel like I sit around all day and I'm like, I don't, I'm not exactly happy with how I look right now, but you know, it's a work in progress. Okay. I think the issue is I don't know enough buff Asian guys to, to have an accurate read on like the reasons why you're doing it. You know, like obviously Mm, from a general case, I'm like, yeah, if you're doing it only to look like white guys or like chase the standard, it's like, that's not great. I would probably look a little, you know, maybe ask yourself why you're doing that. But, you know, if you're genuinely doing it for yourself, I'm like, you know, go for it. Um, It it just really depends on how influenced you are by like external factors versus like an internal. This is what I think looks good. Yeah, but then, like, my question is, is, like, why do you think that looks yeah, good? Yeah, no, for sure. Yeah, yeah. And, like, who shaped that? Yeah. It, it is a little bit of always both. Um, But, yeah, I mean, I, like, a lot of the Asian guys I know, they're not, like, super buff. You know, they're just they're chilling. I'm, they don't seem, you know, mm-hmm. <laughs> I don't know. So, I think it's, I think the short answer is if you're a buff Asian guy listening to this podcast, please chime in with, like, why you want to be a buff <laughs> Asian guy. I mean, I, I get it. I would love to be a buff Asian guy. Yeah, uh, yeah. <laughs> I get it. But like also a lot of questions. Um, yeah. Okay, cool. And so uh, our last thing to discuss today was a uh, a TikTok um, by at Asante Legal or Asante underscore legal. Um, and basically just discussed how law as law is a means of class warfare. Um, law is the way that the ruling class legitimizes its power, which I thought was like a really um, interesting uh, take. And like, um, yeah, I just thought that was like a really good way to like understand like a lot of the stuff that's like been happening lately, especially with like Roe v. Wade and like, um, I don't know, hopefully codifying same sex and interracial marriage. Yeah. Like, I don't, <laughs> yeah, I don't yeah. know. In that same TikTok when I was watching it, um, there was this great example about how, you know, individuals like we're we could be like charged fined like 200 bucks for littering. But like, you know, large corporations, they aren't charged at all for like environmental pollution. Right. And if anything, you know, mm-hmm. the Supreme Court recently was saying that the a- the EPA didn't even have um, the right to regulate carbon dioxide, which was like, OK, huh. <laughs> R.I.P. Um, but. <laughs> To to even tie this to like a person, you know, personal daily life, New York City, right? It's like we have COVID going on in New York City. The MTA still requires masks, you know, maybe like 50% wear masks. But it's like, you know, whenever I see like a cop in New York City or even ma- like Eric Adams sometimes, like they just go kind of freely with no mask and there's no, there's no repercussions. There's no punishment, right? So I think there's, you know, you see so many examples in real life of like rules applying to people who are not in power. So I always think that's a good example that like laws are not unbiased right it's just to protect what's going on at the Mm. moment yeah i mean to your comment about masks and in new york um like cop and eric adams like that's the same thing so i'm i'm not surprised (laughs) yeah exactly exactly yeah and like the first thing he did when he came into power was like we don't no more mask mandate that's ridiculous or like no more vaccine mandate. one of those um so i'm not surprised um mm, yeah. yeah yeah oh okay here here uh, relatedly and also what I remembered we, we we covered this like a little earlier in like one of our earlier seasons but like um, Uber right Uber and like the whole whatever prop that was in California I can't remember the number but like the one that would have reclassified gig workers as employees um, oh it's yeah, interesting. yeah 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 it's like interesting to see like companies say uh, influence the law um, in that way right like they they put out a lot of propaganda that was like this is bad like this this you know like a lot of people love yeah. being gig workers they earn more blah 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 blah. whatever yeah, yeah, yeah. but like i love then, being exploited right <laughs> but like when it <laughs> when it comes to like repercussions of the law or like even i mean even really just societal repercussions they're just like we're just a company we, we're not a person we're not like we yeah. can't do anything about this we're just a platform but then like it's like okay, about a uh, awful analogy, but it's like um, uh, Toby slash Obito from Naruto. The way he's able to like um, be transparent and and like have things go through him and then like rematerialize again. Like it feels mm. a lot like that. <laughs> mm, okay, yeah, very loose example, but I'll go with it. Yeah, <laughs> yeah, yeah. <laughs> yeah. I can't do anything, but now I can. Now I can't. No, right. No. Exactly. Yeah, exactly. Like yeah. Um. So it's just, I, I don't, I don't know. I don't know how you're supposed to like 
fight that like in a class war right so yeah yeah i think i mean that's i think that's where like protests and boycotts come in right and i guess yeah i mean that's yeah i mean ideally yeah that, that, i guess that's our form of like quote lobbying um is, is mm. through the public protest but um yeah yeah okay well um that's that's all the items we had on our outline for this week um so Hope you enjoy the episode. Uh, again, you can follow the podcast at Politically Asian Podcast on Instagram, at Politic Asian Pod on Twitter, or email us Politically Asian Podcast at gmail.com. Uh, support us on Patreon. Or if you have no monies, you can leave a review on Apple or Spotify. Give us the five stars, please. And uh, yeah, cool. Um, until next time. And thanks for listening. Bye. Bye.